Hi, I'm just. Hi, welcome to the Alchemist Show. I'm Justin Brew with Mr. Cook talking about cinematic universes. Now, to start off with, many people don't know what the term cinematic universe is. The term cinematic universe means a series of films that are set in the same universe but are not direct sequels. And I have a and I have some examples that I want to go over today. And the first one being the Dark Universe. This one is a failed one. It started off with Tom Cruise's The Mummy, and what it was supposed to do is release a series of films that were based off of the old horror monsters like Dracula, The Mummy, Frankenstein, The Werewolf, all those. And those were properties that Universal already had, because they kind of they did those in the 40s and 50s, and they, they made a lot of money with those, so they were hoping to piggyback off the Marvel Universe and DC and cash cow there and unfortunately it flopped for them it did and like another failed one the amazing spider-man universe also failed um this started off with the amazing spider-man 2 the one with andrew garfield and it was supposed to re release a series of films similar to dark universe but like dark universe it failed with the same reasons as the dark same reasons as the first film was just too distracted and it focused on setting up instead of the actual plot of the movie thus it just became a cluttered mess and the amazing spider-man from sony it, it actually has three different actors playing spider-man starting with toby mcguire the first two films in that were really uh, uh, thought of well and the third one was like you said they tried to cram too much into it uh, and then the next reboot uh, with Andrew Garfield had two, and you talked about the second one, and the third one now is Tom Holland with uh, Amazing Spider-Man, uh, and I think they're on their third movie there, which this one, it kind of has the blessing of both Marvel and Sony because uh, they've worked out some kind of deal to have Spider-Man in the MCU. And they've been working pretty well recently with some projects like Venom is... Venom Mother Be Carnage is somehow considered into the Marvel Universe with its post credit sequel. Yes. And not speaking of Marvel, but there is a another cinematic universe related that is probably pretty well known currently, and it is the DCEU, starting from Man of Steel and Batman vs. Superman, Justice League, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman, those movies are part of the extended universe, and they have they have, they have a much darker tone as opposed to the Marvel ones, and they aren't accessible, aren't as successful as the Marvel movies, but they recently have been gotten a lot of praise because they've been thinking outside of the boxes as opposed to Marvel. Uh, DC kind of uh, fell down in the first couple films. Uh, Man of Steel uh, made, a, made money, but... Uh, People didn't like kind of the uh, way Superman was handled in that one, and then the Justice League and Batman versus Superman were kind of messed up. Um, and I don't think they had the vision that Marvel did about laying things out in multiple years. Marvel's had 20, 20 plus or twenty six or so movies to work with, starting with uh, Iron Man, their first big hit. So the DCU. Uh, Wonder Woman, she has two films. Aquaman, they were they were uh, done pretty well, so they may have righted themselves, and uh, can't wait to see what they come out with next. And another one that I'm excited for, if they decide to make another movie, is the MonsterVerse. This considers the famous Toho monsters, Godzilla, Mothra, Ghidorah, and such. And the movies that are part of that one are... Godzilla from 2014, Kong Skull Island, Godzilla King of the Monsters, and Godzilla vs. Kong, which has which has gotten pretty good reviews last time I checked from earlier this year and as of right now I think it's probably one of my best one of my favorite films for this year. Kong versus Godzilla? Yeah. Okay. And they it made quite a bit of money, so we're sure to see some more monsters coming out. Uh, and King Kong is an oldie. He comes back, comes to us from the 1920s. 
Godzilla from the 60s. So uh, I think they've they revived those franchises. Uh, ever so often we get a Godzilla movie, but it, it used to be the guy in the rubber suit kind of moving around toy buildings and things, but you know, technology is a lot better now. Right. And another thing is that the Godzilla versus Kong movie, the r- that remake didn't happen for until 60 years later, so I was very happy to see that come back. And another cinematic universe that is widely known and has, honestly, way more right now, way more properties in it right now and still coming, is the Star Wars Cinematic Universe, which consists of the nine movies, the sequel trilogy, the prequel trilogy, and the original trilogy, which is the best, and all the side movies like Rogue One and the Clone Wars show and stuff like that. They've had a pretty big uh, presence since the first Star Wars uh, with Lucas getting into merchandising and gaming and always had the the brand out there so it never really went away but it it started to tackle different media like animation and uh, now back with the live action films and on TV uh, with the uh, Mandalorian and, and the other things coming down the pipeline we're, we're sure to see Star Wars until you know the next 50 years Speaking of the games, one of the Star Wars games is getting a movie, so again, they're trying to milk this franchise for what it's worth. Yeah. And another cinematic universe is the Venom universe. This one is pretty recent. They started off with Venom in 2018 with Tom Hardy, and it continued with Venom Let There Be Carnage, and it will still continue with a new film coming out, Mobius. And what's interesting with this is the Venom is a standalone. They don't need the uh, uh, Spider-Man, which in the comics it started with uh, Spider-Man. He was the suit for Spider-Man when Spider-Man was the, had the black suit. It was a symbiote, a living being that uh, would have given uh, his webbing and uh, make him a little bit stronger. And it, and it was interesting to do this because Spider-Man was a very important part to the Venom character. That's all for me. Thanks for listening. About 20% of students are bullied each year. Out of 100,000, seven will commit suicide. Bullying is not a joke. It's time we stand together and stop the bull. This is my third time coming on here, and this is The Alchemist Show. Today I'm talk about Dr. Dre. Dr. Dre is an old person 
back in the 60s and 70s, 80s, and 90s and 2000s and 20s. His real name is Andre Ramo Young, born in 2018-65. For his play, it says Compton, California. His place right now is um, Los Angeles, California. His greatest album is The Chronic. His not so worst but worst album is Compton. And his Met album is 2001. Most male featured artist, in my knowledge, is Eminem, as usual. Least featured male artist is John Connor. The least featured, most featured male female artist is Candice Pele. And the least featured female artist is Jill Carter, which I know one out of the four. Actually, two, but. Most viewed song is Still Dre by Snoop Dogg and him. He is the originator and stuff and yeah. Least viewed song is a mix. My god, it is a mix always. His mom is Vernon Young and his dad is Theodore Young. His children is Andre Young Jr., LaTanya Danelle Young, Marceau Young, Julie Young, Curtis Young, Truth Young, and Tyra Young. Wow. Holy cow. His siblings is Warren G, Shemeika Crayon, Tri Tri Tyree Caron, and Jerome Caron. His discography is The Chronic, 2001, Compton, Dr. Dre, represents the aftermath, and The Wash. Others like NWA group like Strata Compton and they keep it simple. Then we're just going to place with brother, brothers for life. And side note, he and his group is already in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, which Eminem is going to be eligible now due to 25th anniversary of Infinite. Beats by Dre is his side um, companionship or production. It would debut in 2006, an inventor himself and Jimmy Levine. Originated in Monte Cinema, Monte Cinema, Monica, California. Okay. The headquarters now is Culver City, California. The parent of origination is Apple. Headphone speakers and earbuds in general, like the 2009 headless. Wireless headphones, 12 wired headphones, 12 wireless headphones, Beats Pill Plus, Beats Studio 1, 2, and 3, Beats Solo 1, 2, and 3, Power Beats Pro, Beats Flex, Beats Studio Buds, and etc. Rumors, which the first topic was I already said, was Eminem X LR Cool J X Dr. Dre, which I already said I'd be out to school and listening to it. His rumor GTA song he's supposed to release, which was now canceled. And his rumored album, which his rumored album was, it's supposed to be going around 146 songs. That will be a world record to break, because there was a world record with 111. But if there was, if that album came out this year or Possibly next year or two years from now, I, I would say congratulations, Dre. And yeah, and his, I don't know what the album ca called, but I'm presumably per say like 2022, like his 2001 album. And that is possibly it. I am Michael Moses, and what, what? today on the Alchemist Show. Bye-bye. Hey, I was thinking we can get our workout on, like a little speed run game. Yeah, I'd be ready to do anything right about now.
could start with 100 push-ups and then 100 sit-ups. That's a crazy amount of numbers for a short amount of time. Alright, you win. My stomach hurts bad, probably from all those chips. Yeah, all I have to say that and all I do is sit around my belly. I think it's time for a nap. This time. Huh. Uh, not much. <laughs> You've been working out way too much, haven't you? Slow your roll before you're in a hole. The important thing is to take care of yourself and have fun. Hi, I'm Anna, and today we're talking about The Wolverine. The Wolverine is a superhero film featuring the Marvel comic character Wolverine. Wolverine was born as James or Jimmy Howlett. Did you know that? I didn't know his name was Jimmy. But eventually he did gain the name Logan. He's a well-known mutant born with retractable forearm claws. Apparently, while in the making of the claws, they were supposed to be like a snake with fangs. He is a physically inclined man, and he has powerful healing. He is a co-leader of the X-Men. He is in plenty of the X-Men movies. He is also known as a hero and a veteran of many wars. A little bit about Wolverine is he was born in Alberta, Canada. He was raised by a red-haired girl named Rose. When his father was killed by the groundskeeper, he had his bony claws protruding from his hands, and he stabbed what turned out to be his real father to death. Eventually, those events led to his mom committing suicide, and Rose took James to a mining colony to live, and he gained the name Logan. Alright, so Logan has superhuman strength. He can lift a little bit more than a normal human could. And a, a well-known ability of his would be his durability. Every time that he's in a fight, he comes back stronger again. And he hasn't, he hasn't died from the majority of his fights. And he heals not long after. Another one of his abilities is agility. He has very fast reflexes. And, and he has great senses. For example, he can smell and hear very well. And a weird fact is that he also has very great taste buds. But one of the senses that he's not really good with is his eyesight. Although he he can tell if you're looking at him from afar, I think that's just like another keen sight or sense that is just far out. And then he has another another ability, which is animal empathy. He can tell other animals how he feels and to leave him alone. So he can basically read uh, read the animals' wavelength, something like that, and he can. If he doesn't want them to mess around with him, he'll just look over at them and basically be like, shoo, go away, I'm not really feeling it. Because one of the scenes in the movies, there was a bear that was in the woods with him, and he, he didn't want to deal with it, so he just looked over, and the bear left him alone. And whenever that bear was shot with an arrow, he was very upset with it. Moving on, did you know that Wolverine could die? He has multiple weaknesses, one of them being decapitation. He wouldn't be able to heal himself, but his adamantium and his skeleton makes it very hard to do so. Speaking of adamantium, Wolverine has that in his back. It's a type of metal. It, it can be damaged only if it's superheated and he 
he normally doesn't have them on fire or anything like that. He can't break animanium. Unless they're superheated, but yeah. Animanium slowly, it slowly kind of poisons him. He's, he's not supposed to have that in his body. It, it's a strength and a weakness at the same time. It brings him chronic pain and frequent coughing. And the main weakness he has would be his healing powers when it's drained. They can't be restored once it's damaged. Once it's damaged, he takes far longer to heal and his aging process is restarted, making it possible for him to have graying hairs or die from bleeding out. In the revised timeline, they have the animation slowly poisoning the inside of Wolverine, causing the healing powers to weaken. Another weakness would be his brain damage. When his brain gets damaged, it takes a long time to regenerate. When he loses his memories from a shot to the head, it might take a while before his memories regain back. He still acts like himself, just he doesn't know people's faces from his memory. So, you don't really want to be around him whenever you forget stuff. And his enemies. The main enemy that I think Wolverine has would be William Stryker, which is the, f the main first guy that started torturing and was his former captor. He, he was the one that made Wolverine the, the first lab experiment. He took the DNA from Wolverine and he eventually made another child out of Wolverine. So Wolverine technically has a child from his own DNA. And William Stryker overall did the most messed up things. It gave him sort of PTSD. And then another enemy would be Reavers, Donald Pierce, Xander Rice, which that dude almost made all of the mutants extinct. And then another enemy would be X-24, which happens to be his perfect clone. It's just another ruthless form of Wolverine. It doesn't have like any empathy. It's mainly just the exact same look and DNA of Wolverine, but just the personality wise isn't the same. And then Silver Samurai. That enemy was I think the most hardest one for Wolverine to fight because he almost lost all of himself from it. He Basically, he couldn't really fight Silver Samurai that well because Silver Samurai could cut through his claws because he had animanium heated and could just e easily cut through Wolverine and that was so painful to him. It cut through his claws. And it, d it wasn't a very good match. And the overall box, uh, <laughs> the box cut thing, the movie made around four thousand. <laughs> all right, four hundred thousand million dollars was made by the Wolverine franchise. All right, that's all for me. fire to go to the next fire. Know all the ways that they could put it out any type of fire. Visit the fire safety website at www.nfc.org for more tips. Hi, welcome to The Alchemist Show. I'm Elena and I'm here with Justin talking about 
uh, minority representation in shows. So the first show I want to talk about is The Owl House. The Owl House follows the main character, Luz, who is a Dominican-American teen from Connecticut. Uh, she navigates her way in the boiling aisles trying to learn magic as well as trying to go home. Uh, so the show has a bunch of really good LGBT plus representation. Um, this starts with the main character, Luz, who is actually a bisexual and goes to um, having lesbians and non-binaries in the mix as well. Um, even though the non-binary character, who is known as Rain, was not shown very often, uh, I think they're in like one or two episodes. I think it was two. Yeah. Because I, I know they're in the one that's, I think it's Ida's Requiem. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, that's, that's their episode. Um, also the main pairing of the Owl House, um, the Midi is, is an LGBT ship with Luz and Amity. Um, the show is also very culturally diverse, uh, having the entire, like, witch culture and then, like, the human culture and that mixing neither side really completely fully understanding it and having to learn and adjust to the other side or basically Liz's friends and uh, her kind of caretaker Ida having to like try and understand human human mannerisms and things uh, there's an episode in season two where Liz is using emojis and Amity just cannot understand it that I think is a really good uh, representation of this. Um, the Owl House also deals with uh, quite a bit of classism, which is like um, people of different classes thinking they're better than lower classes. So. This is very prominent with Amity's parents, or at least Amity's mother, because Amity's family is in like lower upper class, I want to say, uh, just just off assumption of what we've seen in the show, and she just does not like Amity being around uh, weaker witches, which includes a human, so. Next show I want to talk about is Shira, uh, which follows the main character Adora as she kind of like works to keep um, her home like free and safe after kind of coming to the crashing realization that the people that raised her were the bad guys when she thought they were kind of the good guys. Um, and you've watched, you haven't watched the whole thing, but you've watched clips and you can basically confirm there's maybe two straight people in this entire show. Oh, yeah. 100%. There's only two. Yeah. And it's a very feminine, female-dominated cast, too. So, like, it's it's basically just the lesbian show. Like, that's, that's what it is. That's what it is. Um, the main character, even, is a, is a lesbian. Uh. She actually ends up with the person that is the villain for the most of the series, Katra, which their relationship has always been complicated for various reasons we will not get into. Um, Shira also introduces us to uh, more non-binary rap in Double Trouble. Um, Shira actually did this before Owl House, and Double Trouble is just they're very interesting to watch on screen. Um, they're very charismatic, which is, which is uh, understandable seeing as they're an actor, and they kind of have to be. Um, Shira also gives us 
very, very good autistic rep in Entrapta, who is just the best to watch. And you look like you want to say something, so please do. She is. She's, in my opinion, she's the most entertaining character in the whole show. She's she's a wholesome being. She's a wholesome being. Um, next show I want to talk about is Community, which is just filled to the brim with rep. Like, main cast, none of them have anything in common, except for the fact that they all go to this one community college. Like, race, uh, most of them are not your typical white person. Uh, Shirley and Troy are both African American. Um, Ben Chang, who is introduced later, is Asian American. Abed is Islamic American. And the other three members of the main cast are all white. So there's definitely more minority groups than uh, not. Um, it also gives us a good bit of LGBT representation with the Dean, who is a confirmed pansexual. I believe the creator of the show once called him a pansexual twink, which is <laughs> you trying not to laugh. It's, it's a funny way to describe him and makes complete sense. Um, also talking about the Dean, he is very comfortable uh, cross-dressing and can be theorized to be gender non-conforming, uh, which would make sense since he's dressed as Lady Gaga and just a whole bunch of things. He's definitely not scared to go around in a dress. Um, show also gives us a lot of religious rep representation, and this is not something the show uh, tends to uh, avoid either. There's actually a Christmas special where this is the main focus because uh, Troy is Jehovah Witness, Annie is Jewish, Britta is an atheist, Abed's Muslim, Shirley is the only Christian, uh, Pierce is revealed to be a member of a cult or a quote-unquote neo-Buddhist, and <laughs> Jeff just kind of doesn't have an opinion on the whole thing. Um, that's, that's about all we've got for today. So I'm going to close this up. I have schizophrenia and psychosis. And sometimes it makes it hard to tell what's real and not real. Especially hearing. When people I don't know start to talk to me, they get in my personal space. And I start to panic and I hear voices. I just want to be left alone. Hi, I'm Logan Palmer. I'm talking about a mystical creature known as the Owl Bear. An Owl Bear is a fictional creature originally created for the first Dungeons and Dragons fantasy role-playing game in the 1970s. In early development of the game, creator Gary Gygax got the inspiration from a small bag of Hong Kong early dinosaur toys before they were even classed declared as dinosaurs in a dime store. Some figures look plain weird like a dragon body with the head of a dog and an armadillo with mammoth stuff. And others would become part of the game like the large bug, the rust monster, and Bulin. The owl bear early design looked very different with a large tail and a long beak. The owl bear is described as a eight 8 to 10 foot cross between, a, you guessed it, an owl and a bear. According to descriptions in the Dungeon and Dragon search book, 
The owlbear are carnivorous creatures. They live in mate pairs in caves and hunt any creatures bigger than a mouse. In the game's third edition, it was declassified as a myth magical beast. The actual in the game origin of the owlbear has never been de- sophisticated, did revealed. But as variant monsters manuals edited it, indented it as that and it was probably produced it of a wizard experiment. The owlbear is mostly a head of a is mostly a head and front claws of an owl on a bear's body. But some people believe that it could known to fly, but games are always shown to walk on all fours and stand on the hind legs to do most of the attacks. The owlbear becomes one of the most famous monsters in the Dungeon and Dragons game, returning in other games for years. In 1977, edition Dungeon and Dragons, the first edition, and many editions to come. In 1991, basic Dragons and Dungeons for younger people who want to play. Even the Dungeons and Dragons video games, appearing as a regular enemy in the arcade games, Tower of Doom and the sequel, Shadow of Mysteria. Then so on the online games, either as a rise or beast fights. But Dungeons and Dragons weren't the only games to use the Owlbear. The Owlbear appeared in the Warcraft franchise in several forms and other fictional games and books, but not much in movies and TV shows like other mythical creatures like dragons, griffins, minotaurs, and others are. But as long as the role-playing game Dungeons and Dragons still lives on, so will the fan-favorite piece, the Owlbear. And that's my show for the day. Everything feels pointless. Like I'm stuck in a cycle in the same day it is just stuck on loop. I keep having these thoughts and about how pointless it all is, and there's no stop. Can we talk to somebody about it, Alex? No, everyone else thinks I'm fine. So ha- have you been having any thoughts of it too much? That's good. Bad you're saying like that, but good it's not worse. I was in a similar position as you when my aunt died. I'm taking some illness courses. Isn't that stuff for people who have really bad mental health problems? No, medication can be for anyone with mental health issues. Therapy, too. Some people go to therapy to help them cope with the stress of life. Here. Here's an admission to a psychiatrist. I'm not supposed to talk to you. That's what friends are for. Hey, it's so early in the morning. I want to end the nap on my ear. One of five people deal with some kind of mental health problem. It's not uncommon and it's not invalid. If you're feeling forms of anxiety, depression, or other types of mental illness, Visit NAMI.org to find centers near you to help you, or text NAMI to 741-741 for confidential crisis line. You aren't alone, and together we can help. Hi, I'm Justin Wingeter, and today we, um... I'm going to be going over the second part of the plots for the Fast and Furious movies. Today I'm going to be talking with Justin Brewer. Um, So we're in the second part now. So I'm going to go over Furious 8. It was a 2015 film. Um, It was the first movie after Paul Walker's death 
who um, character name was Brian in the movie that a lot of people mm-hmm. know and love. Um, so they brought in a new guy to direct since Justin Lin stepped down, and they decided to focus on the characters as well, and they started um, with more action and more high since um, – this is also the movie where um, um, Dominic Toretto, played by Vin Diesel, um, turns his back on his family, and then they have to try to save him. So um, what kind of was your thinking on this movie, and how do you feel about it? Um, I thought for the eighth installment, I thought I got kind of bored out after watching this one. I've only watched like the first few, and after this, it was definitely something different, so I, I didn't had that much of an just Yeah, it, it's w- the past couple of movies been way different from what the first ones have really been. Yeah. Yeah. Um, then comes uh, the f- first actual spin off in the Fast and Furious franchise, Hobbs and Shaw. This um, um, uh, featured Dwayne Johnson, um, who played Hobbs in the Fast and Furious movies, and it also featured Jason Stamuth who um, played uh, Deckard Shaw in The Fast and the Furious, and they kind of team up to um, bring down this villain. Um, it focuses on the same things as the Fast and Furious movies do with high action, heist, family, and stuff like that. Um, what do you feel about this movie? Um, one thing that I didn't notice from this one is it definitely made me laugh more probably because it was... The Rock and who else? I forgot. Um, Jason Stamuth. He's a he's pretty funny. He. Yeah, I can't hate a movie that he's in except for the Sharknado movies. Yeah. I think that I think he was in those. Uh, the which movies? The Sharknado movies. Uh, I I remember him in the Megal- Megalodon movie that one. Ah, uh, yeah. That's... But. Okay, moving on to uh, F Nine, Fast and Furious Nine. Oh boy. Here we uh, go. Yeah, which was made in twenty twenty one. Um, it, talk about action in it. <laughs> um, it brought a couple of characters back from the first movies back. Um, it had high action. Um, it really um, had everything that the franchise has made itself into. But it had, um, I don't know about realistic, but yeah. What was your feelings on it? I didn't watch this movie. I did watch the trailers, though, for it, and I have never seen such a... I honestly thought this was a joke. I legit thought that this was a joke, but whenever I saw that it was, like, an actual movie, I started to laugh my head off. And also, I have seen clips of two scenes, the bridge scene and the space scene, and there is 100% no realistic in there. But in these movies, they find a way out of this. Um, in real life, I don't know if that would work, but in... Oh, um, no, it won't work in for mov- both scenes. In movie logic, it will. Um, so that is basically all the plots of the Fast and Furious movies. Um, there will be two upcoming movies. Um, I think the 11th one is going to be the last movie they make in the saga. Um, but... Um, there probably will be spinoffs and later movies on down the road, but for now they're going to take a break after that 11th movie. So um, thank you for watching today. Um, this has been Justin um, Winger, uh talking with Justin Brewer. Have a good day.